ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Second Class Kayla Steiner. It's my privilege to welcome you to this session of the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium, made possible by our leadership keynote lecture sponsor, the Class of 1959. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, SEAC retired John Troxell. SEAC Troxell is a retired United States Army senior non-commissioned officer who served as the third senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In this capacity, he served as the principal advisor to the chairman and the secretary of defense on all matters related to the troops of the U.S. Armed Forces. This position made Siak Troxel the most senior enlisted member of the Armed Forces. After his 37 years in the military, Siak Troxel opened his own consulting firm and now serves as a brand ambassador for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Hiring Our Heroes Foundation, the Veterans Leading Group, and Eyewear Safety Systems. He serves as the Vice President for Strategic Planning for Defend USA and the Military Consultant for Alpha Warrior 360 Gyms and Film 45 Production Company. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you SEAC retired John Troxell. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. It is truly an honor for me to be here today and participate in the NCLS. Uh, my name is uh, SEAC retired John Wayne Troxell, as you heard. And I just retired uh, uh, just over a year ago after 38 years of active duty, culminating as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense. And what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about something that is very crucial uh, in anybody that is a part of the warrior class associated with being in the United States military. And it's preparing for the conditions that you will encounter on the worst day of your life. And that worst day of your life could be in combat, it could be in training, it could be in everyday life, but the bottom line is training so that you're best prepared for it. You know, we have a key document that the uh, Secretary of Defense authors called the National Defense Strategy. And that uh, document is based off of our National Security Strategy that is authored by the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. And within that national defense strategy, the secretary outlines the threats to our nation. And in the current strategy, which was authored by Secretary Jim Mattis two years ago, uh, it states that uh, the threats to the United States are kind of a two plus three. Meaning we think that uh, for the foreseeable future, we are going to be involved in long-term power competition with two near-peer kind of uh, competitors. Russia and China. We don't necessarily think that we're gonna to go to war with them in the immediate future, but we know across the elements of national power that we will be in a competition phase with these two nations and looking to gain competitive advantages or impose costs below the threshold of conflict. Now that doesn't mean that just because we're competing that we won't be able to respond to crisis or to fight and win if necessary but we understand that it's this long-term power competition where the, the military M of the dime may not be the focus. It may be economics, information, and diplomacy uh, that are at the forefront, but certainly the military part will be key. But also we, the, the plus three involves two rogue nations, North Korea and uh, Iran. We're on any given day, a provocative act or an act of war could happen from one of these nations that it could find us in a high decisive action conflict in the near future. And, uh, and then the last of the plus three is the terrorism threat uh, around the world with ISIS and Al-Qaeda and like organizations like that. Now, don't let there be no doubt, uh, the coronavirus has a huge impact on all of us uh, nation states, but it also has an impact on the, uh, the likes of ISIS and Al Qaeda. And uh, they may be a nascent threat right now, but let there be no doubt their ability to push forward and to recruit, to finance, and to gain momentum so that they can conduct attacks in Western Europe or in North America, uh, that's not gonna go away anytime soon. So being someone that's in the military that is expected to get after this long-term power competition in terms of exercises, 
or stationing of forces, but also being prepared to fight and win means that every day we have to take the opportunity to prepare for the worst day of our lives. So what does that mean in terms of what conflict could look in the future? Well, first of all, if we're fighting a near peer kind of threat, uh, the rise in air to air combat will come up. The rise in surface to air missile or attacks will continue to grow. The rise in attacks on infrastructure and convoy kind of threats from missile kind of attacks or aircraft kind of attacks will continue to grow. And certainly multi-domain conflict will be prevalent as we have to uh, fight and win against a near peer kind of threat. So what does it mean to someone to be best prepared for the worst day of their life? Well, it starts with being physically, mentally, and emotionally ready. And I would even say not ready or just ready, but to be tough. And I would even go as far as to say you have to be hard meaning the exact opposite of soft, not easily penetrable, and you are certainly prepared physically, mentally, and emotionally. And so how, how do you get there? It starts every day with what we do to get after our health, wellness, and fitness to be prepared for that worst day of our life. Regardless of what you do in the military or what your job is, there is a certain level of fitness you have to have. And certainly with a foundation of physical fitness, it makes it a lot easier in terms of building on mental and emotional fitness as we move forward. But also being prepared for the worst day of your life means that you are technically and tactically proficient. You are at the peak of your operating efficiency and performance. And through numerous sets and repetitions in training and exercises through your battle drills and emergency type procedures, you are best prepared or you have trained to a level that puts you in a certain band of excellence that allows you to be best prepared for the conditions on the worst day of your life. Now, to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, let me tell you about my worst day of my life in my military career. I first went to combat in 1989 as a part of the combat parachute assault into Panama known as Operation Just Cause. I did a quick turn and burn less than a year later, and I served in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So I had uh, been exposed to combat and loss of life uh, well over 30 years ago. And then I served in Iraq in 2003 and four, where I lost service members, had been attacked myself and had many wounded. But during the surge in Iraq in 2007 and eight, I was surge brigade number four, fourth striker brigade two ID. And it was during that deployment that the worst day of my life arose. It was on the 19th of July, 2007. And my uh, patrol was on a routine patrol to go out and do what we did, visit troops, check on readiness, check on how we were doing and getting after the enemy and checking on morale, welfare, and basically the, uh, how everybody was doing out and about. We learned in a hurry though, a routine patrol is never routine. And we were attacked by an Iranian explosive foreign penetrator improvised explosive device. It killed my radio operator and severely wounded our fire support officer. And pretty soon we found ourselves in a firefight, trying to repel this fight, treat our wounded, call for a medevac and also call for support. And in the end, I assisted the uh, medical sergeant in treating our fire support officer. And this was July, 130 degrees in the heat I've got 110 pounds of equipment on me, but I had trained physically. My physical fitness program was designed so I would be best prepared for this day. And so as the medevac helicopter landed and the flight medic came off the aircraft and came over to assist myself and two other non-commissioned officers to carry our wounded fire support officer, the 300 meters under enemy fire to the helicopter, I realized in a hurry as two of my, the two NCOs started to fall out and become heat casualties, and even the flight medic started suffering from indications of, of heat exhaustion. And I knew then, although I had taken on the personal responsibility of being best prepared for the conditions on the worst day of my life, 
I had not done enough to prepare those soldiers and airmen around me. And I learned a big lesson there. The bottom line, we got our wounded onto the medevac. The medevac was evacuated. We got our fallen soldier, Corporal Brandon Craig, back to mortuary affairs. But I learned a lesson there that it's just not about individual responsibility. It's about organizational focus and responsibility to make sure the organization is best prepared for the worst day of their life. And even after that uh, tragic incident, we didn't have time to grieve like we needed to because we had to go right back out the next day, back on patrol and get after the mission. And so being best prepared for the worst day of your life is that not every day is a routine day when you're deployed or in combat. And you can never take for granted that because of the lack of enemy contact means that uh, the enemy is becoming less of a threat because at any given time they can attack. And the bottom line is, if we don't look at things through a lens of being best prepared every day and do the things like pre-combat checks, pre-combat inspections, and continue to focus on the mission, complacency can set in. And when complacency set in, sets in, bad things can happen to an organization. So I focus more after that. And I use a phrase called PME hard, physically, mentally, and emotionally hard is what the men and women of our military have to be. And certainly if we have to face a Russia or a China or a North Korea or an Iran, it will be a significantly different fight than we've had in the last 20 years, getting after terrorists and insurgents and the like. So we have to be best prepared for the worst day of our life. The other thing I say is we live in a world now that it is very hypersensitive. Um, certainly coronavirus has something to do with this. Uh, racial injustice has something to do with this. But in the end, um, in our profession, being in the military, we have to focus on being champions, not only championing, getting after the coronavirus and executing prudent risk and doing what is required to make sure we can continue to build readiness and be ready for the worst day of our life, but also champion things like getting after racial equality and getting after understanding the men and women in our formations and that the cultures that they come from are as important as the culture that the leader may have come from. And that the more we learn and grow and come together as a team and build synergy and provide dignity and respect for everyone in the organization, the more combat ready we will be and the more we will be able to execute the mission that is in front of us. And in the end, be able to be best prepared for the worst day of our life. But let there be no doubt. There are some people in the organization who will not have a strive for excellence kind of attitude or will not champion or try to be, reach their peak operating capability. There will be those that are disgruntled in the formation and that they will look to do things through their apathetic actions that will try to make the champion self-deprecating. And some of those champions, as sympathetic as they can be and having a great balance between compassion and discipline, will succumb to the woeful actions of the disgruntled in the organization. And then that's when the organization will have big trouble. It can become polarized. There can be morale issues. And ultimately, the readiness and the performance of the organization may suffer. So for the sake of the organization, our military, every man and woman around you, where you're working at, for the sake of all of that, be a champion and not a victim. And if there is something going wrong in the organization, champion that cause and don't be a victim of that cause and get after it and bring it to the forefront so that it can be squelched or that problem can be solved so that we can continue to drive on with the mission building a synergistic kind of organization and continuing to be ready for the worst day of our life. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about is as a leader, you have to be a leader that inspires. You have to provide purpose, motivation, direction, and discipline when needed 
but you have to be a leader of inspiration. And I would even go so far as to say that you're a leader of inspiration to the troops and you're a leader of intimidation to the enemy. Meaning that you are showing the enemy that you are best prepared and that if they try to take a shot at the title of the United States of America, that it could be the worst day of their life. Now, I'll give you an example my own personal example. When I was the SEAC and I was working in Washington, D.C., uh, in the Pentagon, and on any given day, I could be interacting with uh, the Eisenhower Building or the White House or with Congress in Capitol Hill, or the 270 days I spent out of each year traveling around to visit the troops. I realized that because of what was happening in the world, and because of this rise of long-term power competition and things like that, that we might for a slight second have taken our eye off the fight that we still had with ISIS and other terrorist organizations. Men and women in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, or excuse me, Somalia, Libya, and places like that on any given day were in combat defeating those ISIS kind of threats. And so in order to inspire the troops and get after what uh, at the time Secretary of Defense Mattis was focusing on, meaning we are going to be prepared to not just defeat our enemy, but annihilate them. I mentioned and to remind the world that the fight with, with ISIS was real. I called out ISIS and I told them that they have two options when they come up against the United States of America. They can surrender or they can die. Now, we're a peace-loving people in the United States. And if these terrorists surrender, we will treat them with dignity and respect, safeguard them to a detainee holding facility cell, give them the appropriate food, place to sleep, but also due process. But what terrorists like that, an insidious threat like that, has to also understand is that if they choose not to surrender, then we will kill them whether that is dropping bombs on them from the greatest air force in the world, shooting them in direct conflict, or if need be and all else fails, we will defeat them by beating them to death with our shovels, our military shovels, our entrenching tools. And I said this to inspire the troops, to let them know that we in Washington, D.C. fully understood the mission they had to get after in the Middle East and other areas around the world. And I also did it so that uh, ISIS knew that we were not playing games with them. Now, certainly that was a contentious kind of argument that I gave uh, and, and uh, kind of a talk that I gave. And as it made its rounds across mainstream media and social media, I had many people that were fans of what I said, but I also had others that, uh, uh, we're not very happy with what I said. But in the end, as a leader in the United States military, I was doing and saying exactly what my leaders expected me to say, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense. And so because I made this inspirational and intimidating kind of comment, and because there were people that were not fans of it, I was not going to succumb to those that would criticize me. I was going to champion and stand behind what I said, because that's what my bosses expected me to say. I didn't do it for fame. I certainly didn't do it for fortune. I did it because my job as a military leader was to inspire the troops within our organization and to intimidate the enemy. So as we continue to move forward in this complicated world we live in, and in terms of these threats I've talked about, and who knows what the unknown emerging threats may be, Every one of our, the men and women that are serving in our military, active guard and reserve, need to be best prepared for the worst day of their life. And as I say, it said before, it starts with your physical prowess, which will increase your mental and emotional prowess. And then through constant focus on sets and repetitions in the technical and tactical arena, I can promise you we will be best prepared for the worst day of our lives and ultimately, we will continue to defend the United States, our freedom, and our way of life. God bless you all. 
Good luck to all of you out there that are serving in uniform, are going to serve in uniform, and Godspeed. Thank you very much.